Mighty King, help us thy name to sing. Sing it with me. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious. Come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou. Now to number six eight uh, sixty eight number six hundred sixty eight. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll be what you want me to be. Let's sing it together, all three verses. It may not be on the mountain. So 
trusting my all to my tender care and knowing thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with a heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll go wants me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. Welcome back tonight. It's good to have you here for our evening service. We pray and trust you had a wonderful and relaxing afternoon and uh, hopefully it was warm inside your house how many of you have a wood stove at your house I like it all right very good ashley have it going today yeah he's all excited about his pellets now he called me and he said pastor i got pellets now and i think i'm a long way from pellets but uh, we got some rotten wood that we're trying to get rid of so uh, anyway that's what we're trying to work down at our house but anyway i hope you stayed warm and uh, glad to be here tonight and to worship the Lord together. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this service. Father, thank you for this time together, and we pray that you would uh, speak to hearts tonight. I pray that you would use your word to, again, help us to see truth and to go in the way that you would have us to go. Thank you for that song. I pray that we would not just sing it, but attempt to live it as well. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would have your way tonight. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I've had some people asking, and so I just want to make sure everyone knows again. Uh, we're looking forward to a couple different things. The thing that is happening this week is the Sweetheart Dinner at the Pickle Barrel Restaurant, and uh, that's out West End. Just take a trip down 295, and I think just a little ways down 64, and you'll get there. But just Google Pickle Barrel, you should be able to find it pretty easily. Uh, that's going to be 6 o'clock on Thursday night. And uh, everyone, just you're going to pay for yourselves at the end. That's how we're going to cover it, just an easy way to do that. Things are a little different when it comes to the Sight and Sound theater trip. And uh, what we're doing there is you're going to pay the, uh, for yourself at the hotel. Uh, but then we're collecting payment for the tickets. And I've mentioned it already this morning, but... Uh, Lori Kroom, go like this, Lori. All right, she's collecting the payment, and uh, I, she'll be marking your name off as you pay. $60 for each adult and $40 for each child age 3 to 12. And uh, those under the age of 3 don't cost anything. Uh, but anyway, keep that in mind, and uh, we're going to try to, by the end of February, have everyone have their payments in for the tickets, but they've already been purchased. So uh, th those who've signed up to go, we have got tickets for you to go. We've already done that part of it, so remember that and keep that in mind. Also, um, I mentioned this in the email as well, a couple emails, but it looks like we do have permission from Grace Christian School to be able to use their shuttle uh, to take the trip on. And, and some people have already said, Pastor, I'd like to do that, and I, I feel better about just riding up as opposed to driving up. So you're welcome to do that. Just let me know. Sometimes a trip on a van or a big bus together is fun, and so you all know, we'll go everywhere. We'll do, just like the song says, we'll go where you want us to go. How about that, okay? So uh, sometimes we get a little scared. Well, if I ride on a shuttle, I'm confined to the shuttle, and pastor is not going to want to go shopping. And uh, you're right, but everyone else does, my wife does, and my teenagers do, so we'll go and wherever people want to go, we'll drop off, and, you know, we can do all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun, go up on Thursday. Uh, if you're going on the shuttle, you just have to commit to both nights, Thursday night and Friday night, because that's what we're doing. Uh, but if you set the reservation, uh, you have that opportunity for either Thursday or Friday there at the Fear, uh, Fairfield in, up in Lancaster. We're going to have our ushers come forward at this time. So let me know if you want to ride up. And then again, uh, Thursday night. We look forward to that this Thursday, the Sweetheart Dinner, and uh, that should be a good time together. I hope you're planning on coming and joining us. I'm glad they have enough room there to accommodate us. It'll be a fun time together. And uh, it's time for us to collect our evening offering. Brother Richard Johnson, would you pray for the offering, please?
Let's take our hymnals together, please, and let's turn uh, to number 79. Number 79. It's been good to have Mrs. Freetag here playing the piano all day here today. She's been stepping in. Thank you for being a blessing in doing that. Let's go ahead and sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing together? Let's sing the first two verses, and then we'll greet one another tonight. Sing to the Lord. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If around you tonight and we'll sing the last two in just a moment.
going to sing the third and fourth verse. I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death. Sing to Christ. I'll love thee in life, I will love thee in death. And praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And say when the death do lies cold on my breath. seated. <clears throat> Amen. Would you take your Bibles tonight, please, and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 8, please. I'm sorry, 7. 2 Samuel chapter number 7. I was looking on the other page. 2 Samuel chapter 7. While you're turning there, I did not say this during the announcement time, but next Sunday, this just came about kind of today, and it just happened to come about, and I'm glad it did. Uh, next Sunday after the morning service, uh, there's a group within our church who are not married, but they want to have a little get-together too. So if you are a widow, widower, or a single adult, you don't have to be a widow or a widower, but if you are any kind of a single adult and uh, you would like to uh, get together and uh, have a time to do that, there, uh, a group is going to Anna's after the morning service. Uh, next Sunday okay so single adult maybe you say pastor I'm not single uh, but I come to church without my spouse well if your spouse gives you permission or maybe your spouse wants to even join you later uh, at Anna's you're welcome to do that too but we want to just think of you and we want to make sure that uh, we're thinking about those who uh, may not have a chance to go to the sweetheart dinner uh, and you're in that place we want to have an opportunity for you and uh, so right after the morning service, uh, you can talk to either Mrs. Johnson or Rebecca Serge. They've kind of put their heads together on that. And I think that's a good thing. So single adults, uh, you ha we have something for you too. And that's going to be next Sunday after the morning service. I'll get an email out about that and we'll announce it again Wednesday night and next Sunday. Second Samuel chapter 8. Uh, 7. What am I doing? 8. I don't know what I'm thinking. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. There the Bible says, And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not? Why build not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. 
And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels and will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking that you would help us uh, in this message tonight. I pray that I would say what you would have for me to say. I pray that we would be sensitive to your word. Thank you for the way that you speak to us and deal with us, and that you know us intimately and care about every detail of our life. And I ask that you would lead, guide, and direct in what is preached and in our hearts. Help us to be sensitive to your word. We do thank you and love you. And Lord, may you receive honor and glory tonight for all that happens. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I entitled the message tonight, When God Says No. You know, sometimes that's exactly what God does. And the truth is, God does answer our prayers. Uh, if we go to the Lord and ask him anything in the Father's name, he hears us and he answers us. The problem is he doesn't always give us the exact answer that we want or that we think we, we need to have. And so the answer that God gives doesn't always align or match up with what we were hoping for or what our expectations might be. And we're in a place where we then have to receive what God says or what he does and learn to adjust ourselves to his will rather than trying to make God conform to our will. That's one of the difficulties man has always had, learning to adjust to the will of God. When God tells us no, or when he says wait, or when after he says no, I have something else for you. Uh, many times people can find themselves in trouble where they try to force their expectations or force their desires. We find David after he has brought the ark back to Jerusalem, and in our passage here, he is in a time of peace in Jerusalem. He's driven back the Philistines about as far as they could be driven back. They were unsuccessful each time they tried to attack. His other enemies have been driven back. The kingdom has expanded rapidly. Jerusalem has expanded. Its reach was global now at this point. Many people knew who David was and they came and brought gifts and tribute and there were alliances and relationships and David was at a place now where he had ascended and had ascended and had ascended to a place where now he's literally in his own palace made of cedar and he's there in a quiet moment in his life. I want to pause here for just a, a minute and say this, praise the Lord and enjoy the quiet moments of life. Maybe you're in a bit of a quiet moment right now. Don't reject that. Embrace it and rejoice in it. You might say the kids are out of the house and uh, it's quiet and kind of sad. Oh, you'll find about how happy it can be as soon as you just adjust and learn to embrace and uh, learn that God has some wonderful moments for you in those times of life. To learn to accept what God is doing and how he might be leading in a different way in your heart. Maybe you're newly retired and you're starting your second act. Uh, maybe uh, you are at a place where you're, you're not frenzied or you're not as busy as you used to be. And right now that's about all our family knows is just busyness and we're right in the thick of it. Uh, right in the middle of life and in the middle of craziness. And all of our kids are still at the house. One's about to go to college. One's a sophomore. And then we have two younger ones and all that comes with that. Uh, our family's about to go into a busy time. Fall and spring are really busy times for us. And here pretty soon all four of them will be in sports. And Johnny's going to play Little League for the first time. And we'll find out what that's all about. And Trent will be playing baseball for his school. And Brooke will be playing soccer, and Nicole will be playing soccer, and uh, there's other things that are happening with us in the spring that will be new that were not happening in the winter in addition to all of that, and 
Heather and I had a little bit of a discussion this afternoon about that, and she was reminding me we're about to go into a busy time and, you know, all that comes with that. Summer and winter are a little less busy. Fall and spring, we get crazy and frenzied. Thank the Lord for the times where you can just sit and listen and hear from God and learn from Him, and David's in such a time. And as he's sitting in his house of cedar in that wonderful palace that had been built for him, he recognizes that he's in what appears to be a much nicer spot, crib, (laughs) a much nicer venue than even God resides. And as he's sitting there, he thinks to himself, this isn't right. This isn't how it should be. Why am I the king, a human king, just a human after all, here in this wonderful palace, probably the best built, most extravagant home dwelling in the entire world, why am I here and then right outside of my palace is a tent where God resides? Something's not right with this. Something needs to be done about this. And I want to say that was a noble thought. And there was nothing wrong with him having that thought. Sometimes in the quiet moments of life, things come to us and we use our mind in a different way. And maybe something comes into our life that wasn't there before and we have a desire to maybe do something and we maybe get fixated on it and think this is what must happen. Well, David had a great noble thought to assemble the greatest materials he could and to build the temple, a permanent place for the presence of God to reside. And so he goes about trying to attempt just that. He approaches Nathan. This is the first time we're introduced to Nathan the prophet. Nathan, for all intents and purposes, we could say was David's pastor. Uh, Samuel had that role before he died, and uh, there were others, uh, Abiathar the priest, that had that role. But at this point in time, as a king, Nathan had that role. He was David's pastor, his spiritual confidant, the one that he would go to and talk with. And he goes to Nathan to give this idea to him. And when I say give the idea, he really just almost demands the idea. Notice what he says. Verse 2, And the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. David's making his opinion known. <laughs> By the way, that's not the first time people have done that to the preacher, okay? And uh, it, that's, that's all right. We're used to that. And, uh, but just keep in mind what happens after that. And we'll see what happens after that here in this passage. And David comes to the pastor and he says, Hey, hey I want to let you know something. Uh, things aren't the way they ought to be. Look at the Lord out there, the presence of God in a tent. Here I'm in a palace. And what do you think about that, Nathan? Huh? Huh? You know, it's almost like he's twisting his arm. You better tell me that I have the go-ahead here. And Nathan capitulates. He goes right ahead, and he gives the wrong answer at first. Pastors are human after all. You know, we can feel pressure just like anyone else, and we can make wrong decisions too. By the way, I'll be the first to admit that I have and that I do. Nathan here said to the king, Go! Do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. You know, David had had a lot of success and a lot of victories. So the the prophet Nathan's like, David, man, God's with you. Just go do what you want to do. And so David feels like he has the go-ahead, and he's about to embark upon this incredible task of building the permanent place for the Lord, the temple. But God had something to say about that. And that's what we must always understand is that God always has the final answer. No matter what we think, even no matter what our pastor or other spiritual leaders may think, God has the answer. You will find, and I have I have worked hard at this many times, and I, I love being a pastor because people will come and they'll say, Pastor, I, I think this is what I should do, or I, I believe that this is what... I ought to do, and, or maybe God is leading me in this direction, and I want some insight and some counsel, and I'm very, very reluctant to ever say, I think God wants you to do that. When it comes to a particular aspect of 
of, of direction for their life. Now, I'm not talking about what God's Word clearly states generally for everybody. I always, always reiterate that. But sometimes people will come and they'll say, I believe this is a job I should take. Or I believe this is a move I should make. Or I think uh, I, this really might be the way God is leading and guiding and directing. I very rarely, if ever, and maybe if I do, I've, I've taken it back and I've said, you know, I was wrong to say that. I hesitate to say, yes, that's what God's will is for you. Because you want to know something? I can't determine God's will for you. God must let you know what his will is for you. Now, pastors, can, they can help. They can help steer in, in a direction. And I often will say this. I can't tell you for sure that's what you ought to do, but I can tell you this. We ought to pray about this together. Let's pray right now. And we'll pray about it. And we'll seek the Lord on it. And I'll all, and you know me, if you've known me for any amount of time, I'll say, let's pray and then let's seek the peace of God. And having prayed and found peace from God, if we have the peace, then we move. If you don't have the peace from God, don't even budge. Prayer and peace is what is so vital in knowing how we are to proceed in God's will for our life. And Nathan, he, he said, go ahead, just do it. Do what's in your heart. The Lord's with you. Well, the Lord wouldn't have been with David in this. And we need to understand, God has the final say. And that final say is sometimes no. What do we do then? I have several thoughts from the passage that I hope will be a help to us. First of all, defer to God and don't dictate to him. Defer, don't dictate. Now, some people take it beyond the pastor or beyond the spiritual leader of this is what needs to happen, and they'll take that approach with God. We're going to go to the Lord, and we're going to pray about God's will. And really, it's not a prayer. It's us just telling God what we're going to do. No, that's not the same either. Remember, David leading up to this time in this great place of ascension and now peace from his enemies was continually saying to God, Lord, should I do this? Should this be my next step? Lord, is this how I need to go? Over and over. Now the tune changes a little bit when he's at that mountaintop at the peak and he's not saying, Lord, should I do this? He's saying, Nathan, here's what we're going to do. And no doubt, he was not considering God, or he was just saying, this is what needs to happen. Well, in these moments, when God gives us a no, or he redirects our, our path, we must always defer to him and not to dictate. You see, the Lord came at night, and he told Nathan something different. He said, go tell David this. Did I ask for a house? Did I ask you to build me a house? It's interesting. I love the response, especially when the Lord or Jesus answers a question with a question <laughs> or with a demand from us. Ho, ho, wait a minute now. Did I say that you needed to do that? Did you get any inclination from me whatsoever that this was okay? Sometimes in dealing with our children, I like to take that approach. You know? And uh, did I ever give you any idea at all that I th thought that this was anything that you should even attempt to try to do you know uh, God approaches David that way through the prophet Nathan and he said to Nathan at night in a dream he said Nathan you got this wrong buddy now you need to go to David and you need to tell him when did I ever ask to have a house of cedar built and tell him this David I took you from the sheep coat from following sheep to be ruler over my people Israel David there's something greater I've done with you than to have you just build a house or build a temple. He said, I took you from the sheepfold and I brought you to the place of being king over my people. I've done something wonderful with your life. And honestly, I am, I am happy that you want to build a house for me. But it's just not my will for you. Would we determine tonight that we would just be at peace that what we think sometimes we ought to do or want to do just isn't God's will for us. And be at peace with that and accept that. 
I have found believers that get themselves in a whole heap of trouble when they force their will and they force their way. I have also found in my own life, by experience, that when I just accept God's way, it goes so much better. And when I'm just willing to say, okay, Lord, not my will, but thine, things fall into place. And it's always the very best thing for us. And we always look back on that moment and we say, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I've told the story about how I was going to be a, a church intern at a church in North Carolina. And I was approved to be an intern through the college, Pensacola Christian College that I was at. And I was so looking forward to uh, going to this church. And there was a pastor that was interviewing uh, different candidates to be the intern and it came down to me and one other guy and I don't know how this got out but I got out that we were like the final two that he was going to decide upon and this was a church uh, where the pastor was going to pay us twice as much as the school told us to pay us it was going to be like a nice spot perfect place to go a bunch of youth to work with and just on and on and when I found out it was between me and this other guy I thought well I got this in the bag I got this wrapped up you know how this is going don't you well, I didn't have it wrapped up, and I actually found out that I didn't get chose. <laughs> I was not the guy that the pastor chose to go with. He went with the other individual. He went with the other guy. And, uh, and I learned from that other guy. I actually went up to him. I said, hey, did you hear back from that pastor? Oh, he said, yeah. He called me and said, I'm the guy. I said, oh, <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. Have a good day, buddy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember feeling so demoralized after that. Like, how could I have been passed over? Well, it wasn't but just a week later that there was another pastor that was coming to Pensacola, and this time I didn't have such high hopes, you know. I ate some humble pie, and uh, I didn't expect much, and this pastor was an alumni, and he was the student body president when he was there, and, you know, well-known on campus, and I thought, well, this is surely not going to go the way I hope it will go, but I'll give it my best shot, and I met with him, and... uh, thought I had a good interview with him, and uh, I learned after I interviewed with him that this pastor was going to take two students to be interns, and the school was going to allow him to have two interns, and uh, that pastor was Tim Zacharias, and he ended up calling me, and I remember him saying, hey, Eric, I want you to come, and I want you to intern with me, along with the other uh, guy that he mentioned, I want you to come and intern with me this summer, and I said, oh, wow, okay, well, that's great. And he said, well, I don't want to hear just that's great. He said, he said, is that a yes? And I said, yes, it is. Sounds good. And he said, all right. And uh, it was just a quick phone call. He said, I'll see you in a few weeks, you know, almost on the phone up like that. And I thought, well, that's awesome, you know. And that summer was one of the greatest summers of ministry I ever remember having. Uh, he had just planted a church. It was nine months old. Uh, and the Lord knew that I was going to plant a church one day. And I didn't need to be at an established church in North Carolina. I needed to be at a church plant where I would see on the ground, hands on, what that would be like and what that would look like. Uh, you know the story, and I won't belabor the point, but of our church building here. And, boy, we went through so many different opportunities. And, you know, Brother Purcell and Brother Cushel and Brother Connor and others, I just, I brought people, and Brother Sullivan was a part of that group. I brought them to property after property after property. And I remember sometimes they might have thought, boy, this, you know, this, I don't know what he's thinking. This is kind of crazy. I can remember one of the last properties we looked at was just, it's still for sale right up here on Pole Green Road, and I thought it was a pretty good deal. It was only $2.5 million for the property. And I thought, well, that's not too bad, I guess. It's a lot of acreage, you know. It's like 50 acres or something, and maybe we could get them down. And we set up this big meeting in a conference room with several of our people, and this owner of the land had his realtor and all these other people. And uh, I can remember in that meeting he said something along the lines of, yeah, it's 2.5, but I'll give you a good deal for $1.9 million. And I just thought, man, that's nowhere close in the ballpark of what would really be feasible. But at that very same time, right around that very time that we were looking at that property, I learned of this building. And it was the exact place God wanted us to be. Time and again, I felt like we were let down. I felt like that didn't happen. That opportunity fell through. That acreage is millions of dollars, and just on and on it went. But God had everything perfectly arranged for us to be right here at 8319 Lee Davis Road, 
And I love this place. I love these little two acres. And I love the place where God's put us. And I love the road that we're on. And I love the central location in Mechanicsville that we're at. I mean, everybody can get here from town. And, uh, and whether you're at 301 or whether you're 360 or whether you come from 295 farther down uh, south or farther up north, it's just a very accessible place. And God did all that. But for a time, I know I was looking at things and thinking, well, this is not good. Lord, why do you keep saying no? What do you have against me? What am I doing wrong? I can remember even saying to Heather several times, are we ever going to get a building? What's not going right here? What am I not doing right? Now, I don't say that to my wife very often, so when I do say that, she takes great advantage of it. And, uh, and I can remember a couple of occasions saying, what's not adding up here? And uh, what am I not doing right? And I won't tell you everything she says when I ask her that question, but she has a lot to say after I ask that question. And, uh, and I just thought, Lord, what, what, what are you doing? And soon enough, God answers. He says, that's not my will for you. I have something ready. Do you know how crazy it would be to spend a couple million dollars on a property just to have the property? And then spend another million dollars just to be able to build? And then another million plus couple million dollars I mean you're five million dollars in by the time you even have a building built and the Lord said for one million one fifth of all of that I'll give you a turnkey ready building but you just have to wait on me and trust me that's how good God is that's what God does but we have to defer to him in life we can't dictate to God we have to say Lord not my will but thine whatever you want I'm ready to accept. And that brings me to my second thought, and I love this. Determine to respond in humble acceptance and praise. So the Lord lays it on David, and he says, David, you're not the guy. And that's hard for a guy like David because David's been the guy from the time he was a 15-year-old shepherd. Well, now he's not the guy. He says, you're not the one who's going to do this. He says, you're going to have a son, and that son, I'm going to establish his throne forever, and he's going to be the one who will build me a house. He shall build a house for my name, verse 13, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Verse 14, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So there's great news here. David, you're not going to build the house. But I'm going to do something even better for you. I'm going to establish your throne forever. My son's going to be born into your lineage. We sometimes refer to the Davidic covenant here. God established the line that would bring forth the Messiah through David at this time and at this moment. He says in verse 17, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak to David. Then went King David in and I just, I love this and we need to not miss this. Verse 18 then went King David in and sat before the Lord. So get the picture tonight, and uh, I'm just going to do this for illustration's sake, and Doug, you might want to have the camera follow me. Uh, David, he hears from God, and uh, he, he doesn't look at God and say, well, why? <laughs> you know? He doesn't look at God and say, well, God, let me reason with you here. I know that you think that I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to tell you why I think I should. He, he doesn't... Come on, God. You know, he doesn't wrestle with God like Jacob did. He doesn't, you know, fight with God. He doesn't uh, tell God that it needs to be his way. He goes in, and the Bible says he just sits before the Lord. You know what that shows me? Humble acceptance. Okay, God. You don't want me to build the house? I don't have to build the house. That's totally fine. As a matter of fact, what you've done for me, I don't even come close to deserving. And listen to the eloquent words that David speaks here to the Lord. 
Who am I, O Lord God? That's a good question for all of us, isn't it? Who am I? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? <laughs> okay, Lord, I get it. Who am I? I don't even deserve to be in this house. I don't deserve to be in this place. I don't deserve anything that you've given to me. And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God. But thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of man, O God, O Lord God? What can David say more unto thee? For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. For thy word's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Church, tonight, if we could respond in such a way, we'd see God move in great and mighty and immediate ways in our life. This is what set David apart. This is why he was different. Okay, Lord. It would do us all well to just sit ourselves down and say, okay, Lord. I'll do what you want. I, I, I'm blessed just to be alive. I'm blessed just to be able to sit down before you as my God. I'm blessed to know you as my Lord. Think about how good God's been to us. Think about all that he has done in our life. And now, O Lord God, verse 25, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And let thy name be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is the God over Israel and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. Let's determine to respond in humble acceptance and praise. God doesn't want you to have the job. Okay, God, I don't have to have the job. God doesn't want you to marry that person. Okay, Lord, you probably have someone else for me. I can accept that. I'm willing to, to give that completely over to you. Lord, you don't want me to have the raise? I don't need one. Lord, you don't want me to have that position or go that direction or be seen in that group or be known in that way or go to that school or have that education or whatever it might be. Lord, I don't have to have anything as long as I have you. That's all I need. And that's more than enough. I have a question tonight. Is God enough? God should always, always be enough. God and God alone. And that's what David is making clear here. And in his response, he's showing not only his humility, but his genuine praise of the Lord. It's a little bit of a different praise than last week when he jumped and twirled before the ark. But now it's a quiet humility. It's a quiet praise before God where he's saying, Lord, I'm, I'm willing. I can take whatever you want, and I'll learn, and I'll do exactly what you want for me. The third thought is this. Decide to embrace God's will for you. Not God's will for somebody else. Not God's will for the person sitting down the pew. Not for that other family, that other brother, that other sister, the neighbor, whoever it might be. Get our eyes off of them and let's say, God, I'm going to accept your will for me. That's the wonderful thing about our lives. God's created us unique. And all of us should embrace that and say, I am happy and thrilled with exactly who God made me to be. Exactly who God made me to be. And I'm not saying that we go around haughty, full of ourselves. Oh, but we should be full of God. And we should say, Lord, I am just thrilled with what you are doing in my life. I'm thrilled with who you've made me to be. I, I'm embracing all that you have for my life. Just be thankful for who you are and what God has done and what God is doing for you regarding his will for your life. Verse 28, And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessing let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. Lord, I want what you want far greater than what I wanted. 
and what you want is to bless my house forever and establish my throne. Hey, that's, that's a good deal. I'll take it. <laughs> I won't be known as the great builder of this temple, but I'll take the establishment of my throne and your covenant with your servant. I'll take it, Lord. Are you willing to take what God has for you? Because I want to guarantee you this, what God has for you is a wonderful thing. And it's unique for you. It's just for you. It's not for anyone else. It's your course. It's what God has designed for your life. A companion passage to this is 1 Chronicles chapter 22, and we see what David does end up doing. He didn't build the temple, but he still had a part in it. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, we see how David was involved in the eventual building of the temple. And he was allowed to do this. Then David said, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. I can almost see David kind of walking around envisioning this is where the temple's going to be. This is where the altar will be. He, he's got the vision. Verse 2, And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance, for the Zidonians and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent of fame and glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. David said, I'm not going to build the altar, but I'm going to prepare it to be built. It's not going to get done in my time, but the one coming after me will do it. You know, I, I hope that we have that same heart that says, you know, I'm not going to be able to get this done. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, but that's why I'm excited about getting it ready for the next generation that comes after me. <laughs> A wise man once said, by the time our face clears up, our brains begin to get fuzzy. Isn't that true about life? We move along, and just about the time we get it together, then it's about our time to go. And God, you know, has us here for the time he wants us here. And we need to do what he wants us to do while we can do it. But trust him with the doing of it. And embrace it and say, Lord... I love you. I fully embrace your will for my life. And even if we don't see it done in our lifetime, let's do all we can to set up those who come after us. I'll tell you, I, I have great vision for this church. I'm sometimes careful to share all of it because you might just think, well, you just are dreaming a dream. And it might be nothing more than just that, like David. Man, I'd love to see properties bought and houses bought and this place expand right here. It could happen all right here. There's ways that it could happen. But I'm comfortable if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, if that's not what God wants. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And uh, I think sometimes people think I'm straddling the fence when I counsel with them or I talk with them because I say, this could happen, but this this or that. And I'm really not trying to straddle the fence. I'm trying to just be honest about life. I'd love to be the pastor of this church as acreage is bought and more buildings are built and things expand. But if God doesn't want that for me and he wants me just to stay in my place and preach my messages in this place for the rest of my time, then that's fine. I'll take that. I am more than happy with that. By the way, I don't deserve to be saved, let alone be a preacher let alone be able to pastor this wonderful congregation, to be at this place, in this building, in this awesome town, in this wonderful state of Virginia, behind this pulpit that I had built just for me to preach behind. I'll tell you what, I've been mightily blessed, and so have you, when you really think about it. You know what we need to do? Say, Lord, 
If you say no, or you say something different, or wait, whatever it is, whatever it is, I accept it. You show me your will and your way, and I'll follow to a T exactly what you have for me. That's the message tonight. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, thank you for the message. I hope it was a help. I know it's helped me. I pray that we would not stand against what you're trying to do or accomplish within us. I pray that we would just humbly sit before you. Just like David, Lord, I pray that we would just sit humbly, willing, desirous of not our will, but yours. And to embrace what you're doing, to learn of you and how you're directing, to not try to force our agenda or our expectations, but God, that we would humbly pray and praise you and then wait on that peace. Lord, you gave David a peace about the covenant you were making with him, and you gave David a peace about preparing rather than building, and there's just as much blessing in that. So help us with these things. Encourage your people tonight. Maybe someone needed this in some way, and I pray that you would speak to us through it. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for even the gift of life and salvation and eternity. None of us deserve it, but you've so graciously given it to us. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you quietly stand with me, please? And we'll just play a verse or two of invitation, but let's take a moment to consider what we've heard from God's word tonight. And as Margaret begins to play, take a moment. Let's pray to the Lord. Let's say, Lord, not my will, but thine. I'll accept what you have. You are able and I am willing. You're the master, I'm the clay. I'm the servant. You tell me and you show me. I will not tell you. I will not dictate the terms. Thank you again for being here tonight. It's been be good to be together. I pray that you have a wonderful week. Uh, let's continue to remember um, Renee Fox in prayer. Do you have a recent update at all, Brother uh, Perisher? Keep praying for Renee, Brother Fox's wife, Brother Perisher's sister. And uh, she still has a ways to go with her health and recovery. And then if you will remember several others in prayer uh, tonight, of course, uh, it's great to see Sandy. Sandy is, he was here today, so we're rejoicing in that. Brother Ty is better. He goes back to work tomorrow. He just is waiting one more Sunday before we see him. Uh, remember the Zins uh, in prayer, if you would, as they're just hunkering down at home this week. We want to keep them in prayer. And uh, remember... Um, Mrs. McAvenny, uh, Susanna, her uncle Dale McCoy uh, died and went home to be with the Lord. He was a faithful pastor for 38 years, and uh, so he has a funeral Monday, and uh, she'll be going to that while Chris stays back with the kids. 
And uh, so remember him. Keep the McCoy and Cooper families in your prayer as they have that homegoing service. And I know there's a number of others who've recently said goodbye to loved ones. Misty Webb is another one. And uh, her mom, Dorothy Savage, just went home to be with the Lord. And the Webbs, you know, we hadn't seen them for a couple of years, and they've just recently come back to a few services. So if you remember the Webbs, and some of you might still have Misty's uh, contact information, or maybe you're connected on Facebook, you just send her a message, be an encouragement there. A lot of folks that we can be a blessing to, and we just need to look for them and think about them. Let's keep them in our prayers. I hope you have a great week, and uh, we'll look forward to meeting back together at the appointed time. Pop, would you pray for us tonight? Dismiss us in a word of prayer.